Hey, what's up guys? So I'm back for another series, uh, this time covering the US Amateur Team West, which just took place uh, this past weekend. So my team actually ended up doing uh, quite well. We got first place, which was uh, unexpected. <laughs> and um, yeah, overall it was a really excellent tournament. Uh, I scored five and one on the first board uh, and the rest of the team like pulled their weight and, and we won. Uh, all of our matches ex uh, except for one. So we finished with five and a half out of six at the end, and we ended up winning uh, based on uh, literally two tiebreak points. There was another team that had just as many match points as we did, five and a half, and uh, we just had slightly, slightly better tiebreaks than they did uh, to end up winning the title. So that was pretty cool, uh, and I figured, as usual, I'll just go through my games here uh, round by round, covering the the highs and the lows uh, as the tournament progressed. Um, so the first round of these tournaments is usually pretty quick because they're all the teams playing one big open section and since we were one of the top teams we're typically gonna play way down and, and we did. Um, so my opponent here was uh, a kid who I think is not older than uh, 10 or 11, I'm not sure, uh, Shashwath uh, Sivkumar and um, okay, he was playing white, he played d4, knight f6, bishop f4, g6, and knight c3. Uh, so the new trendy Verasov, or I think some folks are calling this the Jobava London now. Um, yeah, really popular line and um, definitely an uh, aggressive option for white. So I played d5, this is uh, I think the main move nowadays, just stopping white from playing e4. Uh, black could also ignore knight c3 where white is trying to play e4 and, and play a move like d6 and then we transpose into a uh, perk defense uh, but i like d5 just taking uh fighting for the center and and getting a, a secure structure right from the get-go uh, so e3 bishop g7 and h4 and this is like the modern way to to play the position um, white wants to just play h5 and is very much willing to sacrifice the exchange if knight takes h5, just rook takes h5 and play for the initiative. Um, so I like going h5 in these positions myself, not to allow this, and I feel like this is not such a huge weakness because I have good control over the g4 square, so it's hard for white to create some kind of breakthrough. Uh, so he goes knight f3, I, uh, I castled, bishop e2, and c5. And I'm still following my book here. Uh, I believe there was a game between Nidich and Carlson, where Carlson played this as black and got, I think, a very reasonable position. Um, that game went dc5, queen a5, like our game as well. Uh, and here, Nidich castled. And then after queen takes c5, I think black just had a, a very reasonable position. The next moves being like a6, knight c6, and just developing super comfortably. Uh, instead, in this game, White played bishop e5, which I wasn't quite sure about because, I mean, I think it's a good idea to put the bishop here and, and neutralize the bishop, but uh, the problem is the bishop on e5 is just not very stable and is going to get hit with knight c6 very quickly. And I don't think White really wants to trade this dark square bishop off uh, for a knight. I think that would be a strategic mistake. Uh, so I spent some time and I ended up taking the pawn. I think this actually wasn't the best I could have done. Apparently knight c6 first was a lot stronger. Um, I wasn't sure what I would do after bishop d4, but it turns out bishop g4 is a good move here and the threat is just to take and then push e5 and trap the bishop in the center of the board. So this is already pretty annoying and, and white has to solve some, some really tricky problems here. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think I just played it a little bit too casually, just queen takes c5, winning back my pawn. He goes bishop d4, I play, uh, put the queen back on a5. I figure it's just the most active on this square and, and doesn't get uh, in the way of the other pieces. Also, it's not easy for white to, to hit this queen. Um, then he goes queen d2, which I think is quite logical because normally white is trying to castle queen side in this position uh, and end up uh, attacking on the king side. Uh, but I felt very comfortable here. Um, one line I should point out is that had white taken on f6, um, I take with the bishop and the d5 pawn can't be taken either with the knight or with the queen because I have this trick with bishop takes c3. 
and white loses the queen there. Uh, so after queen d2, he might be threatening to take. For instance, after knight c6, uh, takes, takes. Uh, now he can take with the knight, because the knight is no longer pinned. Um, but I figure this endgame is going to be fine for black, because I can take on d2 and take on b2. So I win my pawn back, and we split white's pawns, and I get to keep the really strong dark squared bishop. So for sure, black is better in this endgame. The, the only question is how much. Um, but I figured I don't even have to allow this, and instead of going for with knight c6, I decided just to start with rook d8, which I think is quite logical. Um, so now if white takes, I recapture, and he can't take on d5. Um, so he goes knight e5, which I thought made sense. I play knight c6, and of course I'm very happy to make this trade here, because after bc, I'll get a second pawn in the center that I can push forward. Um, so instead he just castles. And here is probably a critical moment. Uh, up until this point, I had been fairly cautious and taking my time on each move, because uh, I'm not super familiar with this line, and I wanted to make sure I'm, you know, putting my pieces on all the best squares and, and finding a decent plan. But now that he castled queenside, I, I realized it was definitely a critical moment for like a deep think, because this is the point of the game where it seems like black should create a plan. Uh, I feel like I have a lot of options in the position. I can play bishop e6, bishop f5. Uh, I, consider, I can consider taking on e5 or on d4 and then developing my bishop. Um, and it looks like in most of these cases, black is getting a, a nice position, but it's, well, it's important to find a clear path as to what you want to do here. Um, the reason I really like black's position, for instance, after even just a simple taking on d4 and putting the bishop on f5, uh, is that I have a very easy follow-up just to play rook c8 and put pressure on the c-file. And then I can try to play knight e4, or I can sacrifice the rook on c3, and in some cases take the a2 pawn, and then I'll have this bishop h6 check in the position. So it it feels like all of black's pieces are, are coming to life against white's king. Um, so I definitely felt very excited about this position. Uh, it seemed like black was doing well. I, I felt like white had probably misplayed it, because this plan with bishop e5, bishop d4, I... I didn't feel like it was uh, so successful for white, and well, with the king castled queenside, it's it's very clear that that black should be getting a lot of counterplay here. Uh, and I think I was correct to to be enthusiastic about the position uh, because the position is very good for black, and most of these options that I I detailed are I think suggested by the engine. It's like minus one, minus one point five. So black is getting a, a pretty serious advantage after uh, everything that's uh, let's say kind of like a normal, simple move, like developing the bishop to one of these two squares. Um, okay, but then I found a tactical idea uh, while thinking that really caught my eye, and I spent a lot of time checking it, and it looked like it worked, so I, I ended up going for it. So I played uh, knight takes e5, bishop takes e5, uh, and then I launched into my idea with knight to e4. Um, and this move is probably not the best move yet, but uh, it's not not exactly a huge blunder. Um, the point is, after knight takes e4, my queen on a5 is hanging, um, is that I would have queen takes a2, where I'm threatening the checkmate on a1, and the bishop on e5 is uh, all of a sudden hanging. That happened when I played knight e4 and opened up this uh, discovered attack. Um, and then... In addition to these two threats, at some point I might be able to even take the knight on e4. Uh, currently it's not possible because the rook is hanging on d8 with a check, but there are lines where d takes e4 uh, becomes possible. So this looked very good uh, to me. For instance, if white plays knight c3 uh, to hit the queen, queen a1 check, white can block, but then black picks up the bishop on e5, and we're hitting the b2 pawn, and so black is basically just crushing here. Um, white already has to play something like c3, and then we can include bishop f5, and yeah, it just looks like a fantastic position for black. Uh, also, a pawn up, which is nice. Um, but, well, it turns out it's definitely more lines to it. Uh, so I, I really actually spent a lot of time in this position calculating everything out, uh, because I realized also that after knight e4 takes, queen takes a2, white has this move queen d4, which actually looked a lot more critical, because he's defending the bishop on e5, and he's creating uh, an escape square for the king. 
Um, but then I looked further. So I, I realized I would have bishop takes e5, queen takes e5, queen a1 check, king d2, and d takes e4. And basically the first line I calculated here is that if king e1, I would play rook takes d1, bishop takes d1, and bishop g4. And black is just getting a huge initiative and is probably winning right off the bat, like f3. I can even ignore it and play rook d8 and the bishop on d1 is going to be uh, lost very soon. Um, but then I kept checking and then I found this other move, bishop d3, that white could play as well. Which I thought made sense because my queen on a1 is still hanging and so I don't have time to take on d3. Uh, but then when I was calculating, I found this move queen a4, and that defends the e4 pawn, and it turns out that black is just going to keep this attack, and eventually white loses a piece. So like b3, queen c6, I keep defending the pawn, and next move I'm going to take the bishop. So this also looked completely winning for black. So um, seeing all these ideas, uh, so at this point, you know, I calculated all the way till the end there and, and it looked very very good for black um, so I finally went for knight takes e5 uh, then of course he recaptures because it's forced I play knight e4 uh, and then he spent a little bit of time but then he took because white doesn't really have uh, any other options since the queen is hit and the bishop on e5 is hanging um, so knight takes e4 uh, and here I pause because I knew I, at this point, still didn't have to go in for this whole line with queen takes a2 because black also has a second option to trade on d2, which I like that I had as a backup in case I miss something with queen takes a2, I could always bail out by taking here with check, uh, white's forced to probably take with the knight, then I can take on e5. And we've equalized the material, but we have the send game where black has the two bishops, especially the dark square bishop, I think is a really good piece. Um, so I, I would feel very comfortable playing this as black. I, I don't think black is necessarily much better or anything, but the two bishops is definitely a, a long-term advantage uh, that, that I could use. So this was still fully playable um, and uh, was definitely an option. But when I reached this position, I decided to take a minute to double-check my calculations because, of course, it was a complicated line. Uh, and then, yeah, I basically checked everything, like queen takes a2, I looked at this knight c3 line again, I looked at queen d4, and the line we looked at with bishop takes e5, queen e5, queen a1 check, king d2, d takes e4. I basically looked all over, and, and I was uh, actually in, in a very good frame of mind, I think, because I was telling myself, you know, check for blunders, try to find a reason why it doesn't work. And I really just just totally missed it. Okay, by this point, most of you probably already figured out what, what's wrong with, with the line and <laughs> are, are screaming in your minds um, for me to, to go through it. Uh, and basically, yeah, so I, I ended up taking the pawn. Uh, after some thought, he goes queen d4. I was a little puzzled, you know, like why he's playing so fast because his position is seems to be uh, about to collapse. Um, but it also felt like white didn't really have a lot of options either, so I, it wasn't time to panic just yet. Um, so he goes queen d4, I, I take on e5, queen takes e5, queen a1 check, uh, king d2. And I think at, at this point, when he played king d2, I, I suddenly realized that what I had done. That after d takes e4, uh, instead of the two moves I had calculated, king e1, bishop d3, he has a third option, king c3. Uh, which is basically just just crushing and, and game over. So the point is my queen is of course still hit on a1, but also my rook is now under attack on d8. And if I play rook takes d1, he recaptures, and my queen is still hit, and he's still threatening uh, rook to d8, this time with check, followed by checkmate on h8. And so this double threat I have absolutely no defense against. Uh, my queen already is short on squares, but... Unfortunately, I have no way of getting back to defend my kingside. Uh, if I could play a move like queen a5 check and then defend the d8 square and keep going, that would be great. But, of course, white has uh, the square covered. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, after I played d takes e4, uh, you know, he paused again. And I had already realized, like, that uh, I had just blundered uh, horribly. Uh, then, okay, of course, he played king c3. And uh, then he waited for a moment to see if I was going to respond right away, because obviously from his point of view, he, he 
must have thought he was blundering something since I'm going for this line that to him looks uh, winning for white. Um, so he was probably very confused like what I have in this position. And then when I didn't respond immediately, of course he knew that I, I had simply blundered and and he uh, immediately like relaxed and, and knew he had won the game. Uh, so yeah, this was a, a tough way to, to start round one of the, the team tournament. Uh, at this point, my teammates were all looking at me like, <laughs> what am I doing? Uh, and there was, of course, a crowd forming of like kids uh, trying to figure out what's going on in this position because uh, they could sense th <laughs> that, uh, the excitement that something was happening. Um, so yeah, I spent like, I think maybe two, three minutes here really checking to see if I had any, any way of continuing the game. Um, but there's nothing really black can do. Of course, we can sacrifice the queen on d1, but... Uh, I don't think it would really prolong the game for, for that much. It's just a very trivial win for white, so no reason to, to play on like this. Uh, so yeah, rather than playing on down a queen, I decided to just uh, save the embarrassment and, and just resign the game and, and get out of there as quickly as possible. Um, and yeah, that was, that was really tough for my teammates too, because uh, of course we were favored on uh, the two boards, um, under board one, so boards two and three. Um, but on board four, uh, our player was uh, not favored in his game. In fact, he was, uh, I think, lower rated than his opponent. Uh, apparently, I heard afterwards that he even blundered a piece in the game and was uh, completely lost, but somehow found a way to, to swindle a victory. So we ended up winning the other three games in the match, uh, giving us the match win despite my, my loss. Uh, which was really, really fortunate because the match could have easily went 2-2 and we would have drawn the first game and, and that would have been it for our title contention. So really a very, very lucky start uh, in in the first round. Um, for me, what can I say? I mean, it, it's super tough to blunder like this uh, and it was uh, definitely a tough day for me afterwards because... Uh, if it was a regular tournament that, that I had done this um, with Queen Takes A2, then I probably would have just withdrawn and gone home and, and tried to recuperate somehow. But because it was a team tournament and because we actually won the match, of course, withdrawing was not an option since from a team point of view, you know, 3-1 three, one, three, one is a good result. So I, I had to, to put my personal loss uh, aside. And yeah, so how to get over a loss, right? Um it, since my game was actually one of the first to finish, <laughs> oddly enough, I had some time before the next round, and um, obviously I was feeling uh, quite disappointed and frustrated that, that I'd blundered this badly. Um, you know, it's not like I lost the game slowly, it was really just I had a great position and I went for a line that doesn't work and that was the end of the game. Uh, something that I used to do a lot as a kid, but not so much as an adult. Um, so I decided to go to the gym. Uh, it's usually a good way to to blow off some steam, do some cardio and um, lift some weights and listen to loud music. And that definitely got me feeling better. I, I definitely get a, an endorphin rush from that. Um, and lately I've been having a lot of this growth mindset stuff uh, swirling around in my head, thinking about how, well, setbacks are inevitable, and, and basically it's, it's how you deal with them that determines whether or not you, you make progress. So I realized that the only thing worse than losing this game would be to let it uh, affect the rest of my games. Because if then, if I kept losing or doing badly in rounds two and round three, this would be much worse than, than just losing the individual game. Uh, and if I could come back and have a good tournament, it would be... Uh, all the more uh, rewarding given that I had such a disastrous result in, in round one. So thinking about that for a while and, and just getting my frustration out, I, I think was, was super helpful because the rest of the tournament went much better for me. Uh, I ended up winning all my other games. Uh, so um, yeah, I'll be, I'll be more excited to, to share those with the channel than, than this one. But at least, you know, my mistakes can definitely uh, be instructive for the public and, and I'm sure many players have pretty much all players have blundered like this at one point where you think you've calculated everything in a combination you really took your time but you end up missing just one crucial detail and that's it game over um, so yeah I, I ended up being very happy with with how I was able to to bounce back but um, well this was the the initial 
uh, tragedy <laughs> that was the, the catalyst for, for future success. Um, all right, hope you guys enjoyed the video. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.